Well, my next guest tonight is Neil Greenberg. He's a professor of psychiatry at King's College in London. Professor Greenberg, welcome to the day. The main concern in this pandemic, of course, is making sure that people do not catch the virus and become ill. But there are, there are side effects here. Social distancing, for example, it means self-imposed loneliness for millions of people. Why can this, why can this also be a threat? So what we know, um, having carried out a, um, a rapid review of the evidence at King's College London, is that going into quarantine or isolating oneself can sometimes have long-term mental health effects. Now, it's fair to say that if isolation or quarantine is done reasonably, then actually the evidence is that most of us won't particularly like it, but we'll get on with it and it won't cause any long-term problems. But done badly, it can cause difficulties. So what do I mean by being done badly? Well, first of all, we know that if you don't give people a good um, explanation as to why the quarantine is needed, um, that's not helpful. Um, we also know that if you don't make basic supplies, so food, sanitary products, healthcare products available, again, that can cause problems. Furthermore, if you don't allow people to connect with each other remotely, you know, using Skype mm. or WhatsApp or whatever forms of social media, again, that can cause problems. And then two particular other situations cause difficulties. The first of them is if people are financially put in a lot of difficulty as a result of not being able to go out. And the last piece that we know of is that if you say the quarantine is going to be for two weeks, but then you decide at the last moment to change it, say, to four weeks, we know again that that can cause mental health difficulties. You know, we are just getting a report now, Professor, that all of the UK, where, where you are, is going to be put under a lockdown. So that is beginning in the UK. Let me ask you, in terms of the time, what about if you're told that the, uh, the isolation or the lockdown is going to be for only two weeks, but actually it's really for two months? We've got a case like that in the United States right now. President Trump has implied that in 15 days, everything will be back to normal. What does that do to people's mental health? Well, actually, the evidence, as I said, from, from our review of the literature says that that's, that's definitely a bad thing. We are, um, the evidence suggests that what you should be doing is to give people as realistic an expectation of the period of quarantine as you can. And however long that is, people can begin to get their head around that. What really doesn't go down well is to say it's going to be two weeks and then it turns out to be two months. Mm -hmm. That would uh, help derode the or deride the trust in, in one's uh, government quite a lot. Interestingly, we've done studies actually on uh, military troops who go on deployment. And we know there, too, that actually if you get told you're deploying for six months and it turns out you stay out there for eight months, that has a really bad effect on your mental health. We understand that families, for example, a family of four in a small apartment, as well as the elderly, they appear to be two groups that are particularly at risk um, in, in the current climate. Talk to me a little bit about why is that the case? I mean, why are older people at risk of, of this, you know, imposed loneliness? Well, um, even before the, um, this current outbreak started, I mean, it's fair to say that older people tend to be more socially isolated anyway. So um, being told that they can't go out and having families and friends not being able to come and visit them is going to make that situation worse. Another important aspect with older people is whilst it's not true for all of them, you, many of them find technology quite difficult to deal with. And of course, the way that many people now are staying socially connected is through using uh, remote social media apps and communication apps that maybe older people find more difficult to use. I think in terms of um, families trapped, so to speak, in, in small apartments or without much uh, outdoor space, again, I think it's um, reasonably understandable that they're going to find it hard to, to find a bit of isolating space to perhaps um, mm. sort of measure their thoughts and, and get some perspective on what's happening when there really is nowhere to go. Um, but I think to put it in perspective, it, it is fair to say that certainly in the UK and I, I believe across most of the world, you know, governments are doing what they can to try and make sure that people get the supplies that they need and, and also the ability to connect with others that they need in order mm. to stay psychologically healthy. So I think in, in essence, although those two situations that you described are, are higher risk, I would hope that over time, both older people and, and people trapped, so to speak, in, in apartments would also come to find a way to, to get on with each other, which, which wasn't so bad for their mental health. 
Now, Professor, we've got about 30 seconds. Let me just ask you this. Do you think that Italy, um, it's, do they have a particularly difficult time with um, social distancing, cultures where people are demonstrably more overt, where they are more, more social or seem to be at, compared to cultures where maybe people are not in their appearance as sociable? Yeah, I, I think we are speculating here because the evidence is not available to, to definitively say, but I, I think it follows that it makes sense if you're very much more of a social um, person uh, and or social culture, you would find social isolation more difficult. But I believe in Italy, one of the, the sort of positive messages that's coming out is people out on balconies connecting with each other at the yeah. right distance, showing that actually you can still have a social environment even if you're not right next door to someone. All right. Professor Greenberg joining us tonight from King's College in London. Professor, thank you very much.